project. Um, uh, next, please. Just going over a little housekeeping. Uh, tonight's meeting is being recorded as you would have just seen the uh, pop up for that. Uh, it will be available on the project website within a week. Uh, please be sh uh, sure to share that with your neighbors who maybe weren't able to attend tonight, but would be interested in, in seeing what we've been doing. Um, Christine, if you don't mind posting that link in the chat so people can see that. Um, during, uh, during the presentation portion, we ask that you keep your video and mic off. However, when we get to the discussion period, uh, in an effort to simulate an in-person meeting as much as possible, uh, if you're comfortable, we ask that you turn your, you turn your camera on, and then when called on for questions, you can turn your mic on. Next. Um, with that being said, we want to ensure that this, this conversation is a pleasant experience for all, and that all community members are comfortable sharing their comments, questions, and feedback. Please be respectful and mindful of each other's time, as well as uh, we only have an hour and a half together tonight. So let's keep the questions and comments project specific and on point. And please wait until all attendees have had an opportunity to ask a question or provide a comment before asking a second one. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so if there, you weren't able to get uh, any of uh, all of your comments in, you can certainly email me directly and I'll make sure those are incorporated into the, community, into the meeting minutes as well as shared with the design team. Thanks. Next. So a uh, little bit of Zoom tips. I know we're all pros at this point, but um, just going over these to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, as I said, we're asking people to uh, keep their cameras off during the pr presentation portion, but during the discussion, all you have to do is click the camera icon to turn that on. Um, during that time, you can raise your hand by clicking the little hand feature. Uh, and once uh, you're called upon, you can then unmute yourself. There are additional prompts that you can answer with yes, no, things like that. So you can certainly click on those. We do have chat as, as several people are utilizing already, which is great. Uh, so during the presentation, you can feel free to ch uh, send chats. We'll do our best to answer throughout the meeting, but some of those may have to wait until the, uh, till the end there. Uh, next. So with all those housekeeping items under control, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's meeting. Thank you for taking your time to participate with us. Uh, tonight's agenda includes an introduction of the design team, project overview, some design updates, listening and discussion, and then we'll have closing remarks and next steps. Next. So as I said, my name is Nathan Frazee. I am the project manager from Parks and Recreation overseeing this project. Uh, from our office, I also have Christine Brandeo. She is our outreach coordinator in external affairs. She's a great contact for friends groups. Uh, so her, her email and phone number is there. I also included uh, from the Office of Neighborhood Services, Danielle's contact. So if there's any concerns or issues in the neighborhood that may be not project specific, she's a great contact for that. And then I have uh, Michelle Burnett, who is the principal of the school. She's on tonight with us as well. Michelle, if you want, uh, you can unmute and introduce yourself quickly. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Burnett, the proud principal of the Chittick. And I just wanna greet everyone and welcome you. And we're really excited that this project has started a few years ago and with COVID, we're just thrilled that we're able to get back on board with it. So thank you so much for attending this evening. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next slide. So here from our design team, um, as Michelle mentioned, the project started a few years ago uh, that was spearheaded from the Trust of Public Lands. And on uh, uh, he's been on the design team, but uh, I don't think he's actually on the call this evening, but Kelly, Bowling and um, we'll be showing what he has done for outreach and engagement with the school and students already. And that's what we're building on. But uh, if each member from the design team can introduce themselves. Good evening, my name is David Warner, I'm president of Warner Larson Landscape Architects and we'll be, and the project manager on the Chetic Schoolyard project. 
Good evening. I'm Sumi Buiti, Design Director with Warner Larson. We work with Boston Parks and City of Boston for on several projects. A couple of projects that are sort of in your neighborhood nearby, as one we've done, Henry Grew Schoolyard. If someone of you are familiar with it, that was designed a, almost a decade ago. And recently, Emily and I work on the Haley Schoolyard, which is in Roslindale, but not too far from the school. So look forward to work, working with you all. Good evening, my name is Emily Hunt and I'm a landscape architect with Warner Larson Landscape Architects. Hi everyone, my name is Yiling Wang. I'm landscape designer from Warner Larson Landscape Architects. Thank you. Great, thank you guys. Uh, next slide. So looking at the project schedule, as it was mentioned, uh, the initial outreach and engagement of this started back in 2019 uh, with uh, TPL, which is Trust for Public Lands, doing a design uh, and wish list within the school, as well as a cost estimate. The, those estimates were then used to seek uh, CPA, Community Preservation Act funding, which were secured in the amount of $1.5 million. Uh, with that money, we're now taking the design that they came up with, uh, coming to the community, making sure that that still is, is what was desired and, and reflective. Um, so we have our meeting this evening, um, which is our, our briefing. We'll then work uh, through that into construction documents, putting the project out to bid uh, in the spring and have construction uh, hopefully start this summer, late, late, late spring, summer, and then with an anticipated opening of the park in spring of 2023. So next. So now I'm gonna turn it over to David who will go over the project overview. Okay, thanks, Nate. Uh, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> This plan is from 2019, and this is the um, culmination of that process that Nate was describing, that the Trust for Public Land had worked directly with the school community to, to come up with um, these primary program elements for um, the structured play that you can see in the circles and ellipses that are colored in light green, the um, turf field, which is this central element that includes things like um, sustainable design practices for stormwater management, um, permeable paving, um, you know, there's uh, shade elements as well as incorporating trees. Um, and then in the courtyard space of the building, you can see there's a half basketball court and a kickball court, as well as a, um, there's a, several different pavement games. All of these program elements are things that we are working to keep in the design, but we are, um, you know, working forward with some other um, factors that now I think we'll be showing you in just a minute. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so since that work was done and Warner Larson was retained, we have gone out and performed a detailed topographic and utility survey. Um, the work that TL did was based upon um, information that was from plans of record. And when we get more detailed information, sometimes we have uh, to make some changes or adjustments to the design to work with the existing conditions. So this plan represents a detailed survey that we are using now uh, as the basis of um, the uh, foundation for all of our design work. Next slide. And then uh, we have gone around in nice warm weather last summer, taking pictures and documenting the existing conditions, um, which we see as um, some opportunities and constraints. So the access points we've, we've looked at closely, we see that you have some picnic tables in good condition that might be able to be reused. Um, we're also looking at that large grove of oak trees up on a slope that um, likely has some shallow soils and ledge underneath it. So we want to be careful with the money available to make sure that it's invested in things that are going to be most meaningful to the school, such as the program elements and minimizing costs to um, change grades, for instance, substantially. Next slide. 
And so this was a fun uh, meeting during the pandemic outside um, with the school community. Um, and you could see Nate holding the board and Emily making the presentation, Samir in the foreground. Um, Kelly, who I, I understand hasn't isn't able to join us tonight is uh, in the background. You can see Michelle uh, front and center. We um, developed these use diagrams on the right to show how the program element uh, elements that we saw in the TPL plan uh, could be arranged on the site. Um, and then uh, the plans that we that uh, Emily is presenting are the same as the diagrams on the right. We always start with use diagrams and just make sure through the test fit uh, of the areas necessary for these program elements and the adjacencies of the different um, types of uses that they are in the right place before we start design. So this, that's what this process was involved with. Next slide. Uh, so this is the resulting preferred design option that was one of those four diagrams you saw on the preceding slide. <clears throat> and this shows the, I'll just go um, starting out at Roseberry Road, that there's an existing outdoor classroom to remain shaded in light green. And then the hill, which I mentioned previously, um, we want to make sure that we preserve intact those large uh, mature oak trees and that are likely on shallow soils. Uh, we have this yellow square kickball that's nestled into the corner with amphitheater seating. Um, the basketball is shown in orange, and then the play structures are concentrated more in the center um, upper part of the site, closer to Radcliffe Road. Very important aspect of this design is providing accessibility into the site. So you can see where we're showing an accessible ramp, this dashed pink line. And then um, the turf field, we were seeing the school was looking at this opportunity to keep that within the courtyard space. Um, and then that would be separated from the basketball with this outdoor dining kind of shade permeable paved area. Next slide. And so um, these are the different types of play equipment for the different age groups. Um, we're always designing age appropriate play for children in these two different groups, um, two to five years of age and uh, five to 12 years of age. And um, the types of play equipment range from um, things that are more uh, compact and upright to more traditional post and platform structures. Uh, and then there's hybrid models that include a little bit of both. If you go to the next line, what we have ended up with based upon the input that we received from the school was to have things that are a little bit more challenging um, in types of play and potentially a little bit more compact in their footprint um, because of the need to prioritize the use of the space, but also play equipment that will accommodate the maximum number of kids at one time. So these two, um, the upper and the lower, eight, you, know, you can see the age groups, um, we're showing these two different structures. And the reason why we circled the one uh, to the right, it says hybrid net platform, is that is an integral um, element that can be that is connected to this more vertical structure. We kind of also like the fact that they have a, a, a bit of a science theme to it. If you can read, you know, in, in between the lines a little bit, um, the helix, you know, perhaps of the genome sequence, it's kind of a, our chromosome. It's, it's kind of a nice um, idea that we can have a, a science reference also within the play space. Let's continue. And so um, this is um, what Kelly coined um, a plot twist. <laughs> and uh, I think um, Nate may have alluded to it earlier. The uh, Boston Public Schools has um, determined that it's necessary at this site to include these modular classrooms and shown in this gray rectangle within the courtyard. So clearly the turf field um, doesn't go there anymore. And how do we now work with the remaining program elements to accommodate the play space needs and, and have this really truly reach achieve that original vision TPL worked so hard with the school community. Um, and also to 
you know, understand that this is uh, a park and a school. And where is that line of demarcation? So the park uh, portion of this is really about the, the playground, uh, the basketball court, and then this amphitheater seating, which we are still showing, um, and then the accessible ramp getting in and out up off of Radcliffe Road. We are still providing emergency access into the site, but one of the things um, that was eliminated as well was regular parking. There would be the opportunity for some, uh, I guess, emergency parking type of situation on the basketball court, but that um, it's not, um, it, we wanted to make sure that we're prioritizing this as a play space and a park space, first and foremost. Next. Okay, so um, Emily, you're taking this away. Um, Samir's gonna do the next two slides. Okay. All right, so uh, Emily, I know everybody wants to see what the new playground design looks like, so I'll be quick, but one of our overarching goals whenever we design playground is that we're creating an inclusive uh, playground that's fun, challenging, and safe, not only just really for the children, but we understand that communities also use this playground, whether it's after school hours or on the weekends. So this slide here, which really talks about some four play elements of the play, it's not something that Warner Larson came up with. This is an evidence-based science. A lot of research has gone behind this with child psychologists and people and experts in the industry of play. Uh, without getting too much in detail, like some of the stuff, like, you know, physical is really like the gross motor skills that a child needs as he grows into learning the playground. Cognitive really is kind of talking about critical thinking. So while you're playing, is the child also learning new things? Uh, sensory, is it engaging the mind? Uh, the communication, talking to each other, that there are depths through the through play, they are developing the communication skill. And at the heart of it is also social, because I see also that on this meeting and the chat, you have quite a couple of neighborhood groups here. So how does this bring the neighborhood together and the families together when children are playing? So that's kind of this core slide here. Next. This one, really, I won't really go into too details. I think some of you can see, like when we see the physical aspect, it's you now we're talking about monkey bars, which develops the upper body strength or the things. Social aspect is when children are playing, is there enough shade seating out there for having a social plaza? The, some of the web elements we're showing, the cognitive, that's those have become popular because it does not have like a single access point where you can find the structure. So children are figuring it out on their own and developing the skill set. So each of what we what this slide is showing is that you don't need to have every single element, but you need to have a balance of all of these elements to make a cohesive playground design. All right, with that, I think I'll have Emily unveil the design. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Samir, for going through that. I'm sure everyone's eager to see this design. Um, this is an overall design showing both the schoolyard area. So we are showing the modular classroom area. The final location and size is still being determined. Um, but we are proposing to relocate your existing outdoor classroom table or outdoor tables um, into that area to keep them with the schoolyard. Um, we think they're in really good condition. And so we'd like to keep that element um, on the site. Um, but you can see the dashed red line is now the division between what will be solely the schoolyard and the shared space of the schoolyard and the Boston parks. Um, so I will be leading you through all of these different design elements, um, and then we'll look at some precedent image images of each area as well. So zooming in on the schoolyard and park area. Um, we are really building on the concept that the TPL made that was designed, um, you know, working with kids at the Chittick School. Um, and we were really excited by all the elements we saw and really wanted to keep as many as we could in this, um, in this design. Um, so just walking you through, starting at the top of the page, you can see A is complete accessibility. So we're adding in a ramp um, for universal design that anyone can take and go down it. Um, you know, anyone in a wheelchair with a stroller, um, just anyone who can't, you know, go down the stairs can take this ramp. And we've also added in an element of fun play along the ramp. So that's item D, um, that's sloped play. And we're looking at having synthetic turf surfacing there. So it'll look similar to grass. 
um, but having you know rubber balls or some type of play along the slope and an embankment slide. Um, we are able to fit a full-size basketball court here. And so we have an overlay of kickball and basketball. That's item B. And we do have age appropriate play. So dividing up between the two to five play and the five to 12. Um, I'll show you those more in detail with the precedent images. Um, we have a social space. So we have an outdoor classroom, that's item E. Um, and we see this as a really multi-use space. So flex space, it could be somewhere where a teacher can have a whiteboard and have an outdoor class. Um, it could be a play space, maybe like a pickup game of dodgeball, um, a stage, performances. I think the list is pretty endless here. And that pairs also with the amphitheater seating, item H. Um, so that would be tiered seating, kind of built into the hill. Um, we wanted to keep that area, um, you know, it does have the large trees. That's why we're not building as far into that area. Um, we want to keep it intact, but really playing um, with the topography, um, using the natural lay of the land um, and building that seating into the slope. And then of course, we really wanted to focus on the green design elements. That was a central element to the TBL plan. Um, so we have several different areas of stormwater management, um, different educational tools, um, you know, something like rain garden signage, um, different ways the kids can learn about stormwater and also see it on their site. So something like permeable pavers, um, of course, planting more trees for shade, um, many different items, which I will lead you through in the end as well. Um, and then we do have a lot of different pavement games. Um, you know, a lot of times when kids get outside, the first thing they want to do is just run. So that's why we made sure to keep the track element um, that was in the TPL plan. But we've also added in a lot of different pavement games, and these focus on a lot of different math games so kids can actually learn while they're playing. So walking through the precedents, this is the two to five play structure that we're looking to use. Um, it provides a lot of different access points for kids, whether that's the net climber, the ladder, um, it does have a slide in addition to the embankment slide on the hill. Um, this structure is really geared towards the two to five play age group um, and pretty centrally located too on the, um, on the plan. These are a lot of different smaller elements geared towards the two to five play, um, excuse me, two to five age group as well. So we have a swing set that would have two um, belt swings, which are the standard swings you're probably used to seeing. And it also has a basket swing, which is a group swing. We find this is a really great tool. Um, kids really learn how to cooperate and use it together. And it also allows anyone to use it. Um, so it's really an inclusive element on the site. Uh, we hear that musical instruments are also a really great um, item to have. So we're proposing these along the ramp several different instruments for kids to use. Um, the slope play I referenced before, but now you can see some images. These are the rubber balls, which are really fun. It can be a place for kids to hop back and forth among the balls, or it could be a place for kids to sit and observe um, everyone else, you know, playing or, you know, performing whatever they're doing on the, the playground. Um, so it can also be a multifunctional space as well. Um, the bottom photo is an image of Winter Hill Schoolyard. That's a project we did a few years ago. The scale is a little bit larger than what we're looking at for Chittick, but we just wanted to include it since it shows the rubber balls and um, tiered seating on the hillside uh, adjacent to an embankment slide. And on the right is um, the embankment slide. Um, moving over to the five to 12 play. So this area we bumped out a little bit into the hillside. That was something that was on the TPL plan and we really wanted to keep that. Um, we're looking at a tower element with a bridge and a platform. Um, the post and deck platform piece, that's more of the traditional style of play, but it is inclusive. It does allow for wheelchair um, access, a transfer station. And we really see this as um, allowing so many different access points for kids to play, whether that's promoting upper body strength with climbing, um, you know, or a place for kids to sit and walk. That's what the post and platform allows for. It's a much easier way to access um, a piece of equipment, but this allows really everyone to play on the piece and explore it and learn to take risks. Um, and we're including a monkey bar. We really liked this monkey bar shown at the bottom with the circles. It fits with our circle design theme. 
Um, and then having some type of spinner, we liked this net spinner um, on the bottom right. So the outdoor classroom space, um, this is really our social element, social and educational. It would have a pergola. That's what you see on the top piece, um, a curved pergola that could have seating underneath. It could have a whiteboard allowing for a teacher to have a class there. And then also having a lot of um, the green design elements. So having a planted um, area that could allow some rainwater to run in and water the plants. Um, also having some educational signage, which I will touch on uh, closer to the end. Um, the painted graphics are also really important. This allows kids to just run around, blow off steam, um, but also have fun doing it. We love to play with colors and shapes. As you can see, we took a lot of design inspiration from this circular um, image at the bottom, um, but also play graphics can have a lot of educational opportunities as well. So we're looking into different ways we can bring math and learning onto the play graphics. In terms of site furnishings, I briefly touched on the tiered seating at the amphitheater and also some tiered seating along the slope. Um, these are just some different styles of seating. We do wanna make sure we have seating with backs, with armrests, you know, to accommodate maybe a grandparent or someone who just needs a little more assistance um, and also have these different styles of seating around the schoolyard to allow for a lot of different styles of learning or just sitting. Um, you know, just a lot of different options on site. And of course, the most important are the green design elements. This is something we heard from the TPL um, a lot. And of course, this is something that's near and dear to us as well. We always try and add in as many green design elements as we can. Um, so these are just some different examples. Um, the top photo is a project that we worked on with permeable pavers and also has additional trees um, not only do they provide shade, but a ton of environmental benefits as well. And of course, rain gardens, um, having rain gardens and educational signage is really important. Um, we can do custom signage, which is a really fun element and really customize it to the schoolyard itself. And the bottom left image is permeable asphalt. And that's something we're proposing could be located in the basketball court to allow that entire area instead of being um, impervious, could be pervious to allow for rainwater to infiltrate. And these are just some other elements that we'd like to see on the site as well. Um, so I had mentioned before the planters up near the outdoor classroom flex space. Um, on the bottom right, looking at having trees in the rubber surfacing, this is an image of another playground, the Haley Schoolyard that we designed. Um, you know, incorporating that into the play, it helps reduce the heat issues as well. It can help shade the play structures themselves and keep kids cool while they're playing. And then introducing turf, we talked about the slope turf, um, you know, potentially looking at having a little more turf in the play area as well. So with that, I just wanted to bring you back to the design concepts. You can take a look at it and see, um, see it again. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Nate if there are any questions. Um... Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so at this point, we want to open it up for discussion. Uh, the chat feature is still open, so certainly feel free to put uh, some items in the chat. You can also click the raise your hand, and then we'll do our best to call on you as the, the hands uh, are raised. Uh, you can turn on your cameras uh, so we can see everybody as well if you're comfortable doing so. And I see one hand already up. Valerie? Valerie, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hi. I'm trying to get my, my video up there. If not text savvy. Um, no I just want to say that I'm really, really, really thrilled and happy to see that this um, playground initiative is going forward. I work with um, Arena um, with the um, Trust for Land project when it first started. I um, was very excited about it. And I love the idea that um, all the different apparatus that's going in is, is really being considered for children's safety, for their learning, um, for their fun. 
and also that you're still considering um, the neighborhood. So it, was, it, it is what this, this it, um, started up to be, which is a playground for the for our Chittick, our lovely Chittick, and also for the surrounding community. So I'm really happy to see you guys back. Great job on all, all that you've done so far. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Valerie. I think uh, L. Jackson is the next. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, no, I was. Somebody had popped up <laughs> to ask me. Sorry about that. I was in the process of unmuting. Hi there, everybody. Um, so yeah, I am excited just like Val um, in regards to this playground for our children. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, and so first question is, I'm, I'm curious as to why the funding is coming out of the parks and recreation budget, as opposed to maybe let's say the Boston Public Schools budget or something. And I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that. So I look forward to you enlightening me, uh, enlightening me regarding that. And uh, I just wanna be clear the implications if there are any around that. Um, and then I'm curious as to um, the meetings that took place in 2021, that was strictly for the school um, administration and personnel. Um, I, I didn't hear about anything like that for the community being involved in those meetings. So I'm just curious about that and, and where we move forward. It sounds like there may be some options to, to uh, for the community to share ideas. I don't know. I, I know you all mentioned it was final design. So putting that out there as well. And then last two questions. Um, is there an option for a water element in the design? May not be, I know it's not there now, just asking that. And then um, lastly, in regards to, um, oh, I'm looking on my sheet here, I'm taking notes, I don't see my fourth question. Okay, I'll let that go. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, we can come back to that. Uh, so I'll, I, I think I was hitting, trying to take notes as I was going through. So first the funding is, is not out of the parks department budget or the school budget, it's out of the Community <laughs> Preservation Act. Um, which is a tax on uh, residential across the city that was enacted, um, I think in 2017, maybe. Um, so that money is pooled for three different purposes. It's preservation, open space, and housing. So this project uh, is being funded through that in the, in the aspect of open space. And they have a, a series of um, committees that you can you can nominate a project for funding and they go through the evaluation and award that. So that's how we were awarded the 1.5 million. Um, and then the meetings that took place from TPL were used to you know quantify that budget ask. Um, so that's the funding. And then the meeting with the school that happened over the summer, that was basically the kickstart of having this meeting happen again, um, getting saying we got our funding. We're ready to move forward. We're going to go to the public with this. And that's when we, uh, around when we found out the classroom was, the classrooms were being incorporated. So we needed to navigate that with what exactly the schools were looking to put in there and then work to make sure the design was um, uh, compatible with that, uh, with that space lost. So that that's kind of the, the background of it. What we're hoping tonight is that we can get feedback from you all. If there's some tweaks we need to make, we certainly can do that. But what we're looking for is, is to make sure we're on the right track and we can advance this design uh, into construction documents for, for getting, it, getting it built. All right. And I think, uh, Marilyn, I think you were the next one with your hand raised. OK, hi. Thanks, hi. Nate. Yep. Thanks for replying to my email. Uh, Certainly. Good evening, everyone. Great to uh, see the uh, principal at the school. I haven't met you before, so I'm excited to see you there, Michelle Burnett. I am a retired principal, okay? So all of this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I was a principal in another a town, we used CPA money to create an outdoor classroom as well. So my, one of my first questions is, as you've had to make some modifications, what elements that were proposed by the children? Because I understand that the students were very active that's what I understood, okay, maybe an assumption, but they were active in creating that initial plan. So how much of this still reflects their ideas and their thinking? Could you hear me? Yes, sorry, oh. I had to unmute. Uh, um, I, I also, real quick, I realized I didn't answer the question on water play. I, I missed that. We are not incorporating water play at, the, at this moment. 
Some of that is just a logistics uh, with balancing our budget, as well as uh, it sometimes can be more difficult to have water play in, in classrooms, at particular schools, um, having, you know, at the end of summer, the be uh, having those water turned off when kids can still be around. So at this point, there isn't water play incorporated. But um, to answer your question, Marilyn, uh, we, so, so the TPL plan that if we can scroll back to that um, fairly quickly, that was completely uh, by a wish list and, and engagement of kids. So that the school uh, and maybe um, Michelle can kind of speak to some of the school's engagement and the kids' engagement. And I think we actually do have a child uh, on the call with us tonight that was involved in that output. So it'd be great if she's comfortable talking. Um, but these were the primary elements but that the kids were looking to incorporate. So what we tried to do with the loss of that courtyard is, is make sure we could keep as many of these elements to the wish list of the kids the input from those kids still is reflected in the final design, even though we had to lose a, a decent amount of space of that. So, um, you know, we still have the, the multiple age groups. We still have the green infrastructure, educational components, uh, the kickball, the basketball. Um, and then again, like Emily talked about incorporating the green infrastructure for STEM education, uh, painted graphics that can also uh, simulate some mathematics, uh, math talks type elements in the landscape. Okay, you know, I think that's really important that um, students are engaged as you talked about um, the educational elements of the playground. I think it's really important for us not to lose sight of that those larger learning outcomes we have for our students about learning the design process. So this is part of that process. So I think uh, any work that you can do that brings even a small group of children together. So they understand like what are the, what happens in the design process? Like you have to make change. And I don't think elementary students are too young to understand it, but if you want them to own this playground, I think the more you can actively engage them, whether it's people coming into the school, we had architects who just would come in and talk with kids about problems and they could group problem solve and you've got your expert um, experience that helps kids way, you know, concerns that they may have. And I'm not asking you to change your design. I'm more asking if you are, kudos, keep it up. If you're sure. not, please think about ways that kids aren't just passively looking at this happen uh, oh. to, to their area. Um, Madeline, if I could step in on that, one of the things is the students at the Chittick were actively engaged. Great. Um, the initial design team actually worked with a group of our fifth graders over an eight week period where they actually um, did the design structure. They had their books. Um, they presented different design plans. And there were maybe almost four different designs that then our school our entire school community were able to vote on those. Yes. And so the fifth graders did a lot of the initial design work, but all of the other students had a voice in it also. We ended up with three different design plans that students from K through five had an opportunity to vote on. And still to this day, all of those different con concepts are posted throughout our school. And so that's why we're so excited because even the students that were in fifth grade in 2019, a lot of community members. So again, they're not students at this time, but this is a play space. This is a community space that they will still be able to use. And just thinking about some of the fifth graders that were working on it, when they did it, they were like, this is the best opportunity. Um, I have a voice in something that's really going to take place. And so the children really had a big say in it and the community, but our students, we did listen to their voice and they did participate in that design. And I felt it was a wonderful experience is definitely for our fifth graders because as you talked about the design concept architecture we incorporated math and science and again they were able to work with the landscape designs and so you know that opportunity to open up questions for different careers it really was a great time so we're just excited that children had a voice and now we're able to go to the next phase of this development so yes so important for our students and I see one of our students there who actually voted <laughs> I know I'm, I'm going to put my other question in the chat because I also saw that student. It had to do with how you're going to maintain and is there a role that you think the community can play? <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you, Michelle, too, for, for uh, speaking of that. I think at this point, um, 
we have several hands up. I'm going to go to Helena. Uh, 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 Helena. Okay. Perfect. Helena. And then Michelle. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Helena with Belknell Family Neighborhood Association. Our association is located probably less than a quarter mile from um, this area, but I will defer most of the community comments to the Roseberry Ruskin Dale Road Neighborhood Association and um, the school and its students and staff. But I did want to ask about the painted graphics and learning games and also in regards to the construction. So maybe these two are um, um, inclusive of one another to just see, you know, how the construction is determined and who's going to be doing this construction on this playground, painted designs. Um, I saw the, uh, what was there for, you know, learning styles, et cetera. On, but I just want to make sure there's, there's inclusive um, um, hire for this particular playground development within this community, which is within the community of Hyde Park, we're not really seeing that being transferred over. And also that um, if we're talking about murals or things like that as part of this playground to make sure that it's reflective of our community um, and also hiring artists if need be mm -hmm. that are reflective of our community because we do have artists out there that are not having these opportunities. So I would like to hear a little bit of how the um, uh, the hiring is going to take place about the design and landscape for this particular playground so that, you know, we see that, you know, inclusive of the design, but also that um, there's equity in the hiring uh, that's reflective of the community and the contracting. All right, those are all, all great questions. Um, so the, the, the first aspect, uh, speaking of artists and murals, Right now, we're not proposing any murals on the building or anything, but just some painted graphics on the ground. Those are typically done by uh, our contractors. The project will be publicly bid. So what the design team will work through is putting this into construction documents, and then we will put it out for a bid and contractors can, can submit that. That goes through all state uh, required procurement processes. Um, in regards to bringing on artists, that's a, a great opportunity and maybe we can identify some areas that, that could be done in, but that is typically done through the, um, I see we have murals on the building, so I'm, I'll stay fully corrected on that. Um, so that murals and things of that nature are typically done through the Arts Commission. And that's what the way they can do that is they can put out uh, solicitations for those artists. That process can be sometimes be a little bit longer than we would be looking at for this uh, project. So we, we don't necessarily want the entire project to be held uh, for that to be flushed out, but we can certainly continue to um, advance that through the Arts Commission and have it go through their process. And then I think, uh, so just speaking of the graphics and everything on the ground. Um, so Warner Larson's team has done a lot of playgrounds, a lot of schoolyards. So they have experience on, you know, what types of graphics and everything are engaging for kids. Uh, as, as Emily and, and uh, Samira talked about, graphics that are both educational, engaging, fun. Um, so that's, they're building on that experience, that information that they've done in the past to apply here. And I think, um, I think Michelle's next. Yeah, she can unmute herself. Okay, I think I did it. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Wasson. I'm here with my daughter, Victoria, who was a ch student at the Chittick and voted on the designs. Um, and I know there were some questions about how closely the uh, final design proposed tonight re resembles the student designs and she evaluated that. Um, so if you would like to talk about that and then ask your question. Mm -hmm. All right. So my main question will be is, is the community garden who going to be in the final place? The outdoor classroom? As big as beautiful as it was. I mean the outdoor classroom, by the way. Yep, the existing outdoor classroom, if that's gonna stay. And then do you wanna talk about how close this yep. is to what you guys voted on? Yeah, this is pretty close to what we voted on. A few different things, but a lot of it is really good based on what we voted with. Wonderful. There weren't swings before, 
Right now they're are like we voted on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you like uh, just swinging a single swing or do you like to be in the group swings? Yeah, the group swings are my favorite. Like there's one at our, at, at the playground on that it's not far from our house. Like me and my cousin can walk there, bike there with a, with a grown up. But there's a rope swing there. Mm -hmm. That's like the basket there. swing. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Like that. And we would always work together to get ourselves going and going. And we went almost sideways every time. And it was super fun. Oh my goodness. That sounds so fun. I'm glad, mm -hmm. I'm glad we can have that element here then. So you can do that right here at your school. Mm -hmm. um, so Emily or David, do you want to chime in on the outdoor classroom? Yeah, I'm happy to chime in and David can answer it as well. But um, the outdoor classroom that is there, that's existing, that will remain as is. So hopefully that answers your question. We, when we visited the site, we absolutely loved seeing it. It was really fun to be in um, and then it helped, you know, inspire us with the space for the design. I think. Um, Barbara is next. Barbara. Um, good evening. My, my question is, um, are there any plans for the area on the side of the school? Uh, you know, um, is that Ruskindale or, or Rose, Rosemary? Anyways, there's that uh, green area on the, on the side of the school or, or the money is just allocated for the playground. Sure. The, so we're, we're focusing just on this part of the schoolyard, um, which will then become a public park uh, for this funding. The school will still retain um, the, the green space all the way around the, the other sides of the school. Oh, so no money, um, especially what about the front of the school? I mean, maybe some more greenery could be added there if there is any money left. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think we're already, we're, we're really stretching our money here with all, as it is. So um, at this point, we're just focusing on this, this part of this, the lot. Um, the school, I, th I know there was questions in the chat earlier about just maintenance and, and who's going to be managing this. Um, so it's, it, it will be a partnership with obviously BPS and the parks department. Um, what, what we're looking at is, you know, the parks department will uh, do the maintenance and upkeep in the play yard area that's uh, shown here, uh, including mowing, trash cleanup, and things like that. But for the rest of the property, that will still be under the uh, management of the school department. Okay, thank you. But one more question. The entrance to the area, that's only going to, it's going to be a small entrance, right? So that only... Uh, no vehicles or anything like that would be able to access that area. Um, on the top here, uh, it will be a pedestrian gate. At the southern portion, there still will be a vehicular access um, for emergency vehicles. So that is the fire access to that side of the school, um, as well as during snow emergencies uh, for school staff, but only during snow emergencies that will not be used for vehicles vehicles at any other point. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I know uh, in the chat, there's been a few questions about lighting, um, specifically about safety and, and surveillance. Uh, at this point, we didn't have lighting. I see that it's several people are uh, talking about that. We run into, um, you know, if you light it, people tend to stay in later. Um, versus if you don't, then it, it you know, like all of our other parks, it, it follows the dust to dawn rules. Um, if it is a safety concern, we can certainly look at potentially incorporating some um, more pedestrian scale lighting, but it would not be lighting the park uh, fully at night. It, it, we don't have that in the budget at this point. You want me to mute the next person, Nate? Yes, please. L. Jackson. 
Hi there. Thank you. Um, my question regarding um, the full basketball court. So the demographic of the children, right? I, I don't see them using it. And I understand that you all are making it publicly accessible. The concern is what uh, demographic or population it could attract and especially considering lighting and when the lighting will be on versus off and what that could attract for our community. Um, so I'm concerned about that and wondering if there's opportunity to alter that because I don't feel that we need a full uh, on basketball court. It just invites I think more than what we're interested in the community. I've had this conversation with a couple of residents, uh, neighbors. Um, so I know it's just more than me thinking that my husband's sitting here thinking, saying the same thing. So can you address that please? And then I hear you talking about park, uh, Nathan, quote unquote park. And I understand park can be just considered an open space. But when I think of park, I don't envision this playground. So I get a little nervous because I know we are advocating with the city now for a true green space called a park. So. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted clarity around that too, but really that 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 full basketball court is a, a strong concern and in addition to the lighting and things. Sure. So obviously with the school, they they, you know, with a large group of kids, we also want some more open type play out there. I guess I'll I'll put it back to you. If if it's if we do only have it as a half court basketball, are there any other court type games you could envision or or think uh, the kids would want? I think, and we have a uh, little uh, Michelle Wassenaar's daughter on here. I think she would be wonderful. She's Definitely. so articulate. She could weigh in. I appreciate her weighing in already, as well as uh, the, the principal, Ms. Burnett. But um, if Michelle's daughter could weigh in, that would be better. <laughs> I think if, if, uh, if everybody doesn't and, mind, let's, Michelle, do you want to unmute so, so Victoria can and, weigh in? And can I say one more thing? My husband does have a question, too. He didn't get to get oh, in there. Oh, sorry. So. Yeah. Okay, so the um, full court, um, not only does it not meet the needs of the demographic, that if you're talking about full court, full height, um, they don't even, they're not even tall enough for a 10 foot. But let me go to back to my concerns. Um, one has to do about security and cleanliness. Though um, you said um, Boston parks would take care of the inside for the abutting neighbors, there's a lot of trash that can be left out. Now, now I'm just gonna give you some information because I exercise in that um, playground almost in the summertime through the early fall every day. Besides that, I would, I really want cameras and lighting because I have seen activity, which I've reported to the police, the principal and the maintenance staff. And I don't want 24 hour access because I see stuff, um, because I'm there. And lighting is a deterrent. Because of the makeup of it, um, the people, what's that, what is that street? Radcliffe on Hawkins. Radcliffe, they get to see everything, but this is what happens because the building is like an L, I've seen cars and guys go into the, um, the L part mm -hmm. by that door and doing a lot of stuff. I've seen them go into the um, the garden area. Oh my goodness, hide stuff. Lighting is essential because it gives people the opportunity to see. There's too many places for people to hide. Um, yeah, that is a big concern between security and trash. And I'm talking about trash for the abutters. Mm -hmm. The inside is another matter. Um, that's a serious concern for me. Sure. So uh, what's shown on this plan in, in a red dashed line, that's where we're proposing a fence that would actually uh, secure that inside so that would no longer be accessible after hours, uh, it would have lockable gates. So that's secured by, by the school when they're closed. Um, and then at the southern portion, that would be gated so vehicles would not be able to access the site anymore. Um, and that would be be closed. It still would be access, uh, fully accessible for, by pedestrians, but not vehicles. Um, and then we can definitely look at uh, incorporating some lighting and, and getting some sort of, again, what, we don't want to light it up so that it's fully lit all night long um, either. But I think um, Emily was going to comment uh, from the design team about the courts and some of the comments about the courts. And then Michelle, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll turn it over to Victoria after Emily makes her comments. 
Sure, we hear you on the um, the full size basketball court as a concern. We did want to point out this is targeted towards a younger group. The although it says full size, it's full size for youth sports, so the hoops are also lower, um, and the size of it is also smaller. So it's not an adult size court by any means with adult size hoops. Okay. Yeah, and I can just add to that one. That will believe the decision really to the principal as well, as you can see. There's an overlap with the kickball and the two hoops. If the school feels you just want one hoop and move the kickball without the overlap, so, you, so that serves really as just a half court. Um, but again, it's a decision. You know, we'll look forward to from the school and the community to weigh in on that. Thank Victoria. you. Yeah, Victoria, did you want to? Talk about courts a little bit. Whether kids use the basketball courts and stuff? Yeah. I use the basketball courts between our interest in sports. Hold on, it's hard. It's a little hard to hear you. Like playing an actual game rather than. Sometimes I am interested in playing more playing um, an actual sport rather than, than using play structures. And I know that there are other kids, kids who enjoy like, these sports. Great, uh, that's really good. So, so yeah, so what, what I'll do, uh, well, our design team will uh, rethink the configuration like Samira just mentioned about the courts, um, weigh in with some of the kids in the school and we'll see if we can make sure it's something that's more reflective. Thank you. Yeah, because we have to live around here. So. Right, right. <laughs> Just don't want to invite some other negative activity. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, little one. I think it's Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I'm not sure who had their hand up. Uh, Dorothy, is, is she? let's go with her next. Dorothy should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I'm really happy that this plan is coming to fruition. I'm happy about, happy about that. Uh, I have a lot of the concerns that some of the other neighbors brought up about the, um, you know, the activity that we've been concerned about in the school. I do have concerns about that. I'm really happy to hear, I'm excited about the, uh, you incorporating the physical, social, um, sensory and, and cognitive play. I think that's really going to be good for the kids. Um, also, um, I was wondering about the stairs. The stairs on the on the Radcliffe side is that will they remain? I know you mentioned the handicap uh, area that you will be be um, uh, putting up, but um, uh, will the stairs remain? Are you eliminating the stairs and and doing something else there? Oh, what? I'm I'm just I'm having a hard time. Um, some difficulty seeing, visualizing all of this in that space. And, and perhaps I'm not even look, looking at the, all of the space that is, at, it, it's, is really there, um, but it sounds like a lot and, and it sounds, I'm excited about it, but I'm, I just can't visualize all of that being in that space that's, um, that's, that's, there, sure. that's available. Yeah, um, so those stairs will be retained. So once you come in on that side, you'll have both the option of either going down the stairs or the accessible ramp. Mm -hmm. um, the accessible ramp going down has you engage with the playground much sooner. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to go straight to uh, any of the other elements you, in able-bodied, you can certainly do those stairs as well. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things on this design is, is you know, some of the more curved outer edges that you're seeing, those are going up into the topography a little bit more. So there are some, some elements this, um, you know, engaging with that slope as opposed to dead flat. Mm. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yep. So there, there were some comments just about trash and, and, and upkeep. So our, the way it will work is our, our maintenance crews from the parks department will do regular, um, regular site visits as well. What we haven't shown on this plan, but it, it will have trash barrels that will be installed that will be regularly emptied as well. Typically we have those focused at the perimeter of the park 
And then during higher use times, like summer months, we put some additional barrels that are movable in the interior. And then maintenance will do um, regularly emptying those. Um, what we've seen in the past is that some parks do accumulate more trash than others. And then our maintenance team will just adjust the um, amount of frequency that they come visit to empty those. I do, I will also say 311 is an excellent um, resource. So if those are not being emptied or you're seeing that there was an event and they got filled, that's certainly one way of, of reporting that and alerting our maintenance to go out and empty. And I think Helena, you had your hand up now? Yes, it's Helena. Um, oh, Helena, I'm sorry. The, um, so I just also want to kind of go back to um, the point about the entrance to this, because um, historically I was uh, a parent at the time and helped the principal with the support of getting the, this actual playground that's currently there now. Um, so I want to go back, if there's a different slide, it would have been nice to have some type of 3D rendering um, with all of this kind of there so that people could see this from a different learning perspective. So um, it would be great if someone could do that. I know that's something that can be assimilated um, with some programming and send that out to the school. I know their parents in the school would probably like to see that as well as this uh, Rosemary Ruskindale Road neighbors so that you know this, this architectural view works for many, but you know not for all. But I really would like to see more clarity about the Radcliffe entrance. I know where the entrance is currently and the way it looks right now it really doesn't um, look like community inclusion with the school. Um, it looks like it's you know a school property, school equipment, school this. So I'm really trying to get a better visual effect of how will the community really know? Or if somebody's just driving by, like this is open to the community because there is that gate along that area. Uh, maybe we can pull up the Google map and, and, and just kind of show that Radcliffe fence area so that people can get an idea, you know, and, and a little mouse instruction about what that really will look like. Mm -hmm. so, so we are looking at retaining the existing fence there. One component that will, uh, will help is obviously a public, you know, Boston Parks public sign will be put on that fence, which will indicate that it is a public park. Um, so, so that's that's one aspect of making it more inclusive and, and engaging. Because right now, I think uh, the gate there sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Um, and, and right now, I agree, it, it looks like a schoolyard because that is in essence how it has functioned. Um, I think once it is, you know, treed has that public sign has it will have a rules sign that's associated with it, which is showing anybody that's walking by that it, it is an open space for their use. Okay, and, and what about the design? Is it, is it possible that you can uh, create the, you know, a 3D rendering design so that you can show all of this, um, what you're planning here to send it out. So, you know, mm -hmm. add the people and everything. You can put some dogs in there too, I don't care. <laughs> um, yes. uh, so, so one thing about dogs, it, it actually has. I'm just, I'm up. just, I'm yeah. just saying that jokingly. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean it is a good point. I'll address that dogs just because that comes up. Is that dogs are permitted in parks? Um, they are not permitted in playgrounds. Um, so, whereas this park is almost exclusively a playground, um, I, I think no dogs would be allowed in this in this uh, area. Um, so that just to put that as, as, a, as a rule that will probably be implemented. Um, in regards to 3D design, um, David, do you wanna speak to that a little bit as, as the, the principal designer? Uh, 3D design visualizations? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, we have the capability of producing those. I think the point that um, we're trying to convey this evening is that we need to take this project out to bid very soon in order to have uh, favorable pricing and to meet the construction schedule. So, um, you know, to show something in 3D visualization for better understanding um, would, I'm not sure the, the, the purpose, it's, um, 
because the, the reality is that if there are things that people then might say, oh, can we do this differently or that differently? We're really concluding the design process now. So I wouldn't want to um, set people up for disappointment. Uh, I think I, I'm just careful about how we want to manage that communication process. Um, perhaps what we can do is uh, more of an information outreach. Um, you know, it could be a pamphlet or, or um, a print of this that's more in a three-dimensional view that um, shares the idea of your future schoolyard or your future, future park schoolyard space. Um, we'd be happy to do that, Nate. I know you're probably um, concerned about, you know, whether we have the time to do it or the budget to do it. Um, I'd be happy to, to show something, um, you know, simple, a little easier to understand from a perspective view um, for informational purposes. And, and I appreciate what you're 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 saying here, David. But we have to think about different learning styles. So if we're going to present to a community, I think we, you know, in a lot of things that have been said here this evening, let's make sure we are presenting to a community. I know these are set up for, like you said, this is the final design review. But we're speaking from a community lens and making sure that everyone has an opportunity to understand what's before them and in front of them. So that's what we're you know whatever you can provide that makes it a little bit more easier for a few other people um, within the community that says that uh, this would be a little bit easier for them to understand what's before them. Okay. And yes, we can certainly I, are capable I, of doing that. So I'm just chiming in. We work with Nate and on the timing of that. I mean, we obviously do 3D rendering. So we'll just work from the time frame's perspective, uh, you know, when we can accommodate that. As I said, it's the time frame. We lost some time on this project. And we really want to get this out to bid, but we can certainly do the three D rendering, rendering, and I understand the visual communication aesthetic. How some everybody doesn't understand a plan view, so let us work with Boston Parks and see, you know, what we can produce uh, from a different communication uh, method, so that everybody can understand the plan. Yeah, the time lost, as Samir is referring to, was because of the modular classroom um, intervention, Boston Public Schools. Um, through that curveball at us, we had to have pencils down on our design process for a couple of months. Um, I think one of the things that um, we did differently here, uh, Zoom is always a challenge, right? <laughs> and showing you one slide at a time. But we did have these pictures of the play equipment. Um, and what we could do is um, all very quickly put those on the same page as the plan view pointing to the locations in the plan so that people can visualize where what those are and where they're going. I think that's one of the things that maybe there's a little disconnect with Zoom. Yeah, Emily, do you wanna, I mean, we could actually just flip back to some of those precedent images just to get a little bit. Um, so if you look on the, the upper right-hand side, she's she's got a, there's a red circle on the plan. Now that you, you've seen the plan and everything, I think that might help identify where some of these components are being placed and help you visualize it in the actual park. Um, so uh, Emily, do you wanna just quickly run through these again, just to help people get spatially uh, reconfigured? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely, I'm happy to do that. Um, so this is the two to five structure. Um, so it's smaller in scale, it's really central to the playground. Um, the swings are next to the two to five structure, but obviously separated since swings are a pretty high use zone. Um, and they're, they have a lot of space around them. Um, so meeting all the safety standards. Um, the musical instruments and some of the play panels are along the ramp. Um, so that really starts to engage people as they enter the playground. Um, this is the slope play. So we have the rubber balls or some type of slope play in this area. And then the embankment slide, it's a little hard to see, but it's in here. Um, we do have it next to a tree, so the tree would help provide shade because slides tend to get pretty hot in summer. And we wanna be mindful of that and keeping kids safe. So having shade on the slide. This area is the five to 12. So this is the older kids, it's a little more adventurous. Um, the piece you're seeing down here is a like basket spinner. Oh, 
Sorry, what was that? Sorry, Emily, there's a little yeah. bit of a delay with the image showing up. So oh, it's showing you. up now. Okay, I will make sure to pause between slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this element over here in the bump out is the spinner that you're seeing here, some sort of spinning element. What you're seeing down here is a combination structure. So we're proposing this taller climbing element um, with a bridge, a rope bridge connection, and then it will have can be connected to a type of post and platform um, that you can see in the upper left corner. Um, and then that will have be functionally linked, so connected to this overhead monkey bar piece. Um, so this offers a lot of different types of play for five to 12. Um, you know, the five to 12, the older age group has much more um, upper body strength. So that's where we're really featuring a lot of that in the structure. Um, the reason we don't have a photo of the structure itself is because it is a custom piece. Um, we really wanted to tailor it to the playground, what fit in the schoolyard, um, what we heard from the students. The students had a wish list that TPL passed along to us. The monkey bars was something we heard and we liked that this was a little more unique style of monkey bars. Um, so that's why you're seeing what will be the structure kind of in different pieces um, currently. All right, I'm switching slides. So hopefully this has popped up. This is the outdoor space. Um, so looking at some sort of shade structure, obviously this is a little bit larger than what we're proposing, but this is the style of what we liked seeing. Um, it could have a bench underneath it, an area for a whiteboard, um, and then an open space in front. We liked the idea of these concentric circles um, that really acts as an area you know, for a classroom first and foremost for the students, but then also open space. Um, you know, it could be an area for kids to sit and watch a play, uh, could be a pickup game of dodgeball is something that kept coming to mind. Um, you know, a lot of different uses. It's always amazing what kids come up with to use it. We design one thing and then kids find a million different ways to use it, which is always really fun to see. Um, I love like watching the games they come up with. It's really exciting. Um, uh, just real quick on that structure, there was sure. some comments about safety elements of that. Um, so it will be designed in a way that it's it's higher up, so uh, school age kids should not be climbing on that, um, and it will be in as secured a design process as we can. Obviously, if people or, or users are are going to misuse the structure, they'll still be able to do that. Um, but we're looking at doing it as in as safe a manner as possible. Absolutely, thanks for pointing that out, Nate. We always prioritize safety in all of our designs. So if there's something in this image that maybe you're concerned about people being able to climb up, we would work with our vendor to make sure it's as safe as possible. Um, moving on um, to the painted graphics. This is something we touched on quite a bit. Um, we're looking at all these different games to engage kids, not just have you know, your traditional hopscotch, but have all these different types of games. Um, another thing is we can also work to make these engage both parents and kids. So if someone is there after hours, instead of a parent just sitting on a bench, they can actually play with their child or help their child um, figure out uh, something more educational. Um, so it's really not just for the, the kid, but also for the parent or caregiver or grandparent, um, whoever they're with, to really engage all these different age groups. Um, onto the next slide, just looking at the um, some of the seating. We have a lot of different seating styles. Um, we had seating in this corner. This is over currently where um, some of the world map and painted games are. Um, but we did want seating around the playground. Um, so having some seating on the slope, some seating up in a higher spot along the ramp to really give a caretaker or a student a good view to um, the whole schoolyard. And then having some smaller benches in the play area as well, because we know seating is an important element, um, not just for students, but for teachers and for caregivers to be able to watch um, and having it centrally located. They're able, if a parent or caregiver has a student or a child, who's younger and older, they're able to watch both areas and feel really safe and comfortable seeing their kids at both, um, both locations. Another one thing I'll mention is that uh, just because those are specific locations of seating, that doesn't mean we won't 
still have the opportunity to provide seating throughout uh, the rest of the design as well. So especially with the reconfiguration of uh, the courts, you know, there's some more opportunities. I know there were some comments about the, the cafe tables or outdoor uh, uh, picnic table type things. So we can look at reorganizing some of those components as well with that uh, element changed. I think Emily, at this point, I, I, there was a few more hands up. So I just want to sure. give them chances to ask the question. Absolutely. I'm so, just going to go back to the main. Perfect. Slide. Great. Thank you. Um, I have no idea what order they were in. So L Jackson, I'm going to call on you first and then I'll get to you, Valerie. Thank you so much. And again, I do appreciate your time for the whole Warner team here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to recap, I believe Samir had agreed to send the 3D to work right, internally, prepare that 3D image. And I did provide the Roseberry Ruskindale Road Neighborhood Association email address that you can forward it to. And I will distribute to the other uh, neighborhood associations and residents. Um, if you don't mind, uh, we'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. My husband wanted to just continue his train of thought though. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be brief and quick. Um, one, throughout the pit ground, um, I'll say the ground part or the flooring is still all rubber, correct? As far as safety, for the most part, where they're, the surface in which they're playing on is rubber? Yeah, yes, so, Un okay. under all of the play equipment uh, that's considered elevated play, uh, that the safety surfacing will be that rubber. Okay. Um, and except then, on the, at least on this proposal right now, the, the slope play there, we have synthetic turf, uh, at least in some components. Okay, um, then real briefly, I'm, I'll be real quickly, uh, real quick. One, when you had mentioned that the, the neighborhood and the neighbors would like it to be thought of as a school, as opposed to public, um, a public um, access. Out. Okay, I'm speaking for myself. And so that being said, because I'm going back to security and, and, and cleanliness. One, you mentioned that it would be picked up. Can we know the schedule of cleaning? And then also, if it's going to be open, I'm just gonna put it out there. How will that be policed? That's kind of, that's not, that's kind of rhetorical, but not rhetorical, just because of what I see. Sure. Um... So, so I'm, I, I mean, at this point, I don't know the schedule. Um, you know, maintenance uh, could be different in the future, and and again, their schedules can change. So, what they'll do is, um, you know, when the park first opens, they will evaluate and, and try and do their best to keep an eye on trash barrels, and they'll they'll adjust their frequency based on the amount of trash and time it takes them to clean up accordingly. So if they need to come back here more regularly to address that, they'll adjust that to make sure that that's happening. Um, in terms of the park being open in public, it, it, it is going to be publicly open. Um, so there, there is no talk of, of locking the, the gates or anything into the public part of this project. Um, in terms of policing and um, you know, ensuring safety, Obviously we rely on the community and, and, and neighbors who are witnessing things like that. We highly encourage 311. I know in the chat feature, there uh, were several questions about security. We mentioned um, you know, any uh, surveillance or call box, we run that through the police department and they are the ones that give the final approval on those based on um, their, their uh, call logs and things in that, in that nature. So. We can certainly, I'll, I'll raise that to the district police station and, and get their way in on if they're fine with that element being incorpor incorporated. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Valerie? Yes, yeah, so I wanna just um, talk a little bit about the cleanliness. Um, is it Boston Public School Department that will be coming out beside the custodians? that would be cleaning because this is now going to be a, a public park as well. Is there going to be another cleaning crew that comes out continuously? Sure. So, so the parks department, the parks department maintenance crew will be doing uh, regular visits. I okay. imagine, um, and Michelle, maybe you can speak to this a little bit on uh, from the school's perspective and custodial work. 
Um, I imagine during the school year, if there is any particular issue that the, the school would be addressing that, uh, especially before letting kids out there. Um, so it, it may be a combined effort, but I, I can assure you that the parks department will be doing regular visits as well. Okay. Yep. And um, what I think, I, I actually was a former teacher at the Haley School and um, I'm a, I pick up trash in the neighborhood all the time. People know me for that. Um, and I usually have to only do it during when school's in, ses in session. There's very, very little trash when school's not in session. Um, so I think that one of the components that's very important to initiate if it hasn't been done already, because I know that Michelle really does a lot of hard work at the school, is for the children to learn that they are the stewards of this park. That, um, because I find we did that at the at the Haley School, and children when once they became stewards, if they saw another child leaving a wrapper or something like that on the ground, they would tell them, "Hey, this is our school. You can't do that. Put that put that in your pocket and bring it in, back in the classroom and put it in the trash." So I think that if we, if we can get the kids to know that they were they designed the park, a lot of what a lot of what's going into it that is their design, and now they have to take care of it as well. Mm -hmm. They need learn to become stewards. I think that's a very important piece to implement into the um, academic um, piece. That's a and, great point. Yes, and the other thing um, I find mostly, because I, I do Roseberry, Ruskin Deer Road and Radcliffe, because I walk my dog around the perimeter and I pick up trash on Radcliffe Road. Now it's usually parents that are parking their cars out there. You'd be surprised at things that I find on the ground. Some things I just, I don't want to pick up. I swear to God, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, like, like a baby's pamper, I'll say it. And, um, you know, other like coffee cups, things that kids aren't using. On my side, I find that I pick up sometimes juice juice car containers or snacks, snack containers and things like that. It's not all them. Sometimes the people driving by as well. But it, the neighborhood is, um, is very, we have 10 streets here. And I hate to say it because we've all the people that work for the neighborhood live on Roseberry Road and, and Ruskindale Road. And we have more trash on Roseberry Road than any street that I walk on. I walk on all 10 streets. Mm -hmm. So we really need to, if we're gonna have a beautiful park, we really need to have a beautifully clean park that people can respect and wanna mm -hmm. come. Certainly. Um, Boston mm -hmm. Shines every year, they um, do a cleaning. So we they ask people, what area do they want to clean? So for the last two, three years with Boston Shine, we've worked to um, clean and also to plant plants around the Ro Roseberry Roadside. Um, we can continue to do things like that, but we don't have, we have, we had like 25 people came out last, this past, um, when did we do that? In May, this past May and help plant a lot on Roseberry Road. We can do more if we mm -hmm. have more people, but if we see that people are taking care of this area and we can get more help through the school to, to, uh, confront, to, to let parents know that we're doing this. I think parents should be out there with the neighborhood doing cleaning up and planting. That way we're working together and being cohesive. That's, those and, are all great. Yeah, great points. Just two other things real quick. Um, someone did mention that if you're not going to put lighting out there, I understand the issue about the lighting. Um, maybe motion detectors um, in a certain area where if someone's starting to come in there late at night, put it in the area where they're just starting to come in to keep them from coming in. And as far as policing is concerned, we can reach out to area E18. Yep. Years ago, 20 years ago, when we had some crime in this area, 20 area E18 stepped up and they were perusing our neighborhood for years and we haven't had any violence in this neighborhood for 20 years one incident in 20 years so we can reach out to area e18 and have them ramp up security now that we have this public park coming absolutely Those are, and yeah, one great more point. thing that's it the barrels yeah. that, you, that you put on the um perimeter around the perimeter can those be barrels that are stationary those black metal barrels Yep. So it, it'll most likely be a combination of those two. The, usually the ones on the perimeter are stationary ones that are, are fixed in place. And then again, during uh, summer months, when we see a lot more users, a lot more trash out there, we tend to put some movable barrels that are more centrally located. Just mm -hmm. that way we don't see a lot of trash spread on the, in the middle of the park. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that's another thing that we the maintenance crew tends to adjust uh, based on use. And again, if they if they don't see a lot of trash in that barrel in the middle of the park, they're not going to put a barrel there. Um, so they they adjust that with how it's being used. Well, if the if the children become stewards and do what they're supposed to do, um, I think the neighbors would, would like to go and use the park. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I think maybe if they could be a sign, no littering. I've been trying to get a no littering sign around the Chittick on Rat Radcliffe Road for the longest time, and we still don't have it. So I don't know if we can get a no littering. And it talks about this fifty dollar fine for littering. We can do something like that. One year I put signs around the whole black iron wrought iron fence about dog poop. Can't mm -hmm. do that anymore. It was too much, but um, I can do it if I have help. Sure. I mean, we're not having dogs inside, so we need a sign that says that. No yep, dogs. Correct. We will. We will be putting no dog signs. I also right. in the chat did post a link for the Boston Blooms, uh, which is a program where you can get uh, daffodil bulbs. So mm -hmm. some of the talk about putting uh, more planting around the school. That's one mm -hmm. avenue that uh, community, you know, community led could could be looking to incorporate that. Uh, just looking at the time, I do see one more hand up, so I'm going to call on uh, Barbara and and let her. Yes, weigh in thank you, that. thank you. This question is for the principal. I did put it in the chat about the parent console. My kids went to the Chittick, and I was chair of the parent console for years, and I got that playground done. But um, how strong is is your um, parent console? Good evening again. Yes, our parents are actively engaged. Um, we actually um, have a family liaison that works closely with our families. And unfortunately, she's not on the call tonight. Um, I believe Michelle is still on the um, Zoom. She was actually part of our parent council um, team at one point. But families are actively engaged and have been um, participants in this entire design process. Oh, so okay. there is a strong, yes. All right, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you as always, Ms. Almeida. Um, I just think back to the initial designs of 2008. And one of the things is as a school and working hand in hand with the community, because it's such a wonderful community and neighborhood, you know, this um, forum to hear from everyone is so important because we want to continue our partnership um, of working and supporting one another. Yes. Certainly. And Absolutely. With, with that being noted, um, obviously we had some uh, engagement about in connections to the neighborhood groups and, and that we're going to be continuing to reach out and engage with you guys throughout the process. Um, so we're going to take tonight's uh, feedback. We're going to make some changes on the designs. We're going to work on some uh, engagement pieces that you guys can share throughout. And then um, the design team is then going to uh, go continue to refine these items, get them into a what we call construction document element uh, to put them out to bid and, and try and get construction started this summer. So Emily, if you don't mind going to the very last page, I see Victoria's dancing for the idea of that. So that's that there's our there's our support for that plan. Um, so we do have a project page for this. It's if you do boston.gov. Uh, and it's in the chat feature now too. So feel free to follow along. Tonight's video will be posted there as well as the presentation and meeting notes. Uh, on that page is my contact information. So if you didn't feel comfortable speaking tonight or you have additional thoughts, certainly do not hesitate to reach out to me. I'll make sure David and his team get that feedback as well. Um, and with that being said, um, unless there's any last minute things, I think we're, we can close the meeting for tonight. Thank you all so much. This is wonderful. Thank yes. Thank you all. You, you provided you. a lot of great Thank feedback. You. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe out there. <laughs>